having Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips with us. In a few moments, he will take the stage and address you on the topic, Madhab of our Rasul. Indeed, all praise is due to Allah, and as such, we should praise Him, seek His help, and seek refuge in Him from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds. For whomsoever Allah has guided, none can misguide, and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray, none can guide. God worthy of worship but Allah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last messenger of Allah. The topic, the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is a topic which addresses the dilemma faced by many Muslims today who have come to understand the importance of learning Islam from the sources, from the Quran and the Sunnah, while at the same time reconciling that with the tradition that we have inherited from earlier generations of the various madhabs, whether it be the Hanafi, the Maliki, the Shafi'i, or the Hanbali, we recognize those scholars to whom those schools of law are attributed as being among the leading scholars of the Ummah, of the past. So when one says, I want to follow the Quran and the Sunnah, and at the same time, he or she is questioned, well, what of the work of these great scholars of the past? The scholars to whom these madhabs are attributed. Do you understand the Quran and the Sunnah better than they did? Can you understand it better than they did? And of course, what can we say? But no. <laughs> no. So then, what happens to following the Quran and the Sunnah? So we're faced with this situation. We know we should be following Quran and Sunnah, but at the same time, we understand that those leading scholars of the madhabs, they were far greater in knowledge than we are. They far understood the Quran and the Sunnah better than we do. So how can we then abandon them and follow the Quran and Sunnah when they were superior to us in knowledge? How can we? So this is the dilemma that people are commonly faced with. The solution, in my view, is the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of understanding what was that madhab. Because we talk about the madhabs, and when we talk about them, we talk about them relative to the Imams of the past. And we know that there were other Imams, like al Layth ibn Sa'ad from Egypt, whose madhab nobody knows about anymore. Yet, Imam Shafi'i said, al Laythu afqahu min Malik. That Layth, Imam Layth, was a greater jurist than Malik. Now you and I couldn't say this, okay? Because who are we to judge? But Imam Shafi'i, he had the right to say this because he studied under Imam Malik for 20 years plus. He was his top student. He had memorized al muwatta And he then studied under the students of Imam Layth because Imam Layth had already died. So he was in a position to weigh the fiqh of both of these great Imams. And he made that conclusion. But today nobody knows about Imam Layth. So this, this is telling us something. 
And of course there are others. Imam al-Awza'i, Sufyan al-Thawri. We have a number of other Imams whose names are lost in history. Most people don't know it. Only people who specialize in fiqh and usul of fiqh, these are the people who come across these names, know something of the history of these people, etc., etc. So, the solution is, in my view, to go back to the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we all believe that Allah is one. This is the essence of the teachings of Islam. Allah is one and unique. And we believe that the human race is in fact one race. Though people have called some people in different parts of the world different races, etc., etc., we know these are false categorizations. They really don't exist. There is only one race, which is the human race. Just one race. And Allah has left signs amongst us to let us know in our times when this issue of race has you know, reached its peak, that there is only one race because He left it in our blood. He left it in our blood. Meaning that if somebody from the Scandinavian countries who is whiter than white, blonde hair, blue eyes, needs a blood transfusion, he is A positive. The rest of his family are A negative or whatever, O. The rest of his family, his close family members, their blood cannot save his life. However, somebody from Africa or India who happens to be blacker than black, with black hair and black eyes, he has the same blood type. His blood can save him when the rest can't. Allahu Akbar. This is what Allah left. He left it as a sign to us. Because obviously, generation before where they weren't doing blood transfusions, this had no meaning to them. It has meaning to us. In our times where we are involved in blood transfusion, technology has taken us to another level. Allah has left His signs amongst us. And this is the time when people are saying, you know, human beings have evolved and all these other kind of things. But the signs are there that we are one race one human race and this is why we believe as muslims that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only sent one religion he didn't send a bunch of religions for different races because they have different makeups and different backgrounds and no he sent one religion islam from the time of adam to the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all of the prophets alayhi salam brought one religion. This is our belief. The multitude of religions out there are from human creation. So we stress, we call people to one religion. We say one God, one human race only needs one religion which addresses all of their needs, which don't change from time to time, from place to place, because they are essentially one and the same. So we don't need a number of different messages. One message suffices. Now, the question is, that one message, are there many ways to follow this one message? See, because here, we're coming with this Tawheed, the oneness, right? Oneness of Allah oneness of humankind, oneness of religion, and then what? Is there one way to follow that religion? Are there many ways? Now, as we reject 
the claim of those who say, as long as you believe in God, it doesn't matter what religion you follow. The people, the people who say this, that all of the religions are like spokes on a wheel. No wheel, it has spokes, and then it has a hub in the middle. God is the hub. All of the spokes are connected to God. As long as you're sincere in your belief, it doesn't matter. We, we reject this. We say no. This is not how it is. That is confusion. Because each of the religions have principles which contradict the other religions in their basic beliefs. Or they claim that they are the only true religion. So how can they then be spokes on the same wheel? No. We reject that. There is only one religion. Inna dina inda Allahi al-Islam. That's what Allah said. Anyone who desires a religion other than Islam as his religion, it will not be accepted by Allah. So now, Islam, the one true religion. Do we go back now to the spokes on the wheel? That Islam is like the center and you have the spokes. Many, many different ways to practice Islam. As long as you're sincere in whatever way you follow, you're on the target. We have, this is the question. This is the question. Because in a sense, when people say, there are four madhabs, all of them are correct. You must follow one. Otherwise, your imam is shaitan. Right? And people say this, right? If you don't follow one of the madhabs, then your imam is shaitan. So now, this is like the spokes on the wheel again, isn't it? Because they're all correct. Even though one madhab says, if you touch a woman accidentally, you don't have wudu. And another madhab says, if you touch a woman accidentally, you do have wudu. They said they're all right. But how can that be? How can you be in a state of wudu and not in a state of wudu at the same time? It's not possible. This, this kind of difference cannot exist. Either you have wudu or you don't have wudu. You can't say, I have wudu based on the Hanafi madhab, but based on the, the Maliki madhab, I don't have wudu. No, it doesn't work like this. And you have people actually who, I mean, I've heard about people from the Shafi madhab, right? Who this is a problem for, right? Because for Shafi, you touch a woman accidentally, no wudu. So what the scholars will tell them in their areas, local scholars today, they will tell them, okay, you're going for hajj. They say, what are we going to do? Go for hajj. It's all these people are going to be touching people, no wudu, and you, you hardly find a place to make wudu, and you know, you're going around the Kaaba, you break wudu, you have to go, <laughs> big problems. So what do they say? They say, what you do is, when you make your intention for hajj, you make the intention to be a Hanafi. <laughs> and when you come back from hajj, then you make your intention to come back to Shafi. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is, um, this is not a joke. Actually, this is actually going on. I've been told this by many people from South India, from Sri Lanka, other areas where there are Shafi's, you know, who are going, that this is what they're being told by their local scholars. Now, is that what Prophet Muhammad Wasallam left behind? Is that the legacy of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Something went wrong somewhere down the line, right? This is what, something went wrong. So we need to go back to see, really, what did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam leave behind? And we have a number of hadiths. Among them, the hadith in which Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the Jews before you, divided up into 71 different sects. 70 of them were going to hell and one going to paradise. 
the Christians were divided up into 72 different sects. 71 of them going to hell and one going to paradise. And you, my ummah, will divide up into 73 different sects. 72 of them going to hell and one going to paradise. And when he was asked about it, oh, what is that one? Some narrations he said, Al-Jama'ah, the community, the group. In other narrations it's clarified, he said, Ma ana alayhi liyom wa ashabi. What I am following today and my companions. He identified that one group that is going to paradise. So in that hadith, we can see that Whenever the prophets came, alayhim salam, whenever they came and they conveyed a message, they conveyed it in one way. Though the people split up afterwards into different groupings and sects, etc., they conveyed it in one way, and only that one way was acceptable to Allah. And this relates also back to the statements of the Prophet sallam, in a way in which he said, Man ahdatha fi amrina ma laysa minhu fa huwa rad. Whoever brings anything new in this religion of ours, which is not a part of it, it is rejected by Allah. That He left behind one way. And anybody who adds to it, to make out of it a multiplicity, this multiplicity will not be accepted by Allah. This is the legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Naturally, if you ask one of the Sahaba, any of the Sahaba, what was your madhab? What is the Sahabi going to say? I'm a Maliki? No. Imam Malik wasn't born yet. So it's not possible. He would say, I follow the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because what is the madhab? Madhab comes from the Arabic verb zahaba. Madhab is the way of going or the time of going. So it's a path. And they even use the term madhab even for madhabs in philosophy. You could have madhabs in a number of different other groups. Madhab is not limited just to fiqh. Though we tend to use the term madhab today only to refer to fiqh. But you could have madhabs in, in anything. I mean, even in the Sufi, for example, system, they use another term, they use Tariqa and Turuk, plural Turuk. Tariqa. Really, there's no difference between Tariqa and Madhab. And there's another word which carries the same meaning, which we all know, and that's the one that we use all the time, and that is what's the other word that means way? Another word. Another word which is everybody knows. The sunnah. Come on. The sunnah. What does sunnah mean? Sunnah means path or way of going. This was the way of Rasulullah. So, really, sunnah, madhab is one and the same. It's one and the same. So, when we say we follow the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We really were saying we're following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now, understanding and implementation of that sunnah may vary among the companions. You will find that the companions differed. There are issues on which they differed. We know the famous example usually given in Usul Fiqh about the case of Banu Qurayza, you know, where the companions after the battle of the Khandaq, battle of the trench, 
where the Prophet ﷺ was told to go and punish the people of the citadel of Quraidha, of this tribe called Quraidha or clan called Quraidha, for their treachery in siding with the pagans who had attacked Medina. And he sent an advanced group of his companions ahead to go and lay siege to the citadel or fortress of the Quraidha tribe. And he gave them instructions. He said, do not pray except at the fortress of Banu Quraidha. So they set out. Don't pray Asr. Don't pray Asr except at the Quraidha fortress. So they set out. On their way, they noticed that the sun was coming close to set. They realized that they would not be able to reach that fortress before the setting of the sun. So some of the companions said, we need to pray Asr. Others said, the Prophet ﷺ said, don't pray Asr except at the fortress of Banu Quraidha. Others said, but what the Prophet ﷺ meant by that instruction was to hurry up and get to the fortress. But Allah has already said in the Kitab al Maqutah, Allah has already said that the Salah is for the believers at fixed and set times. We know this. You don't pray Asr after Maghrib. It's just not appropriate. So obviously Prophet Muhammad was not telling us to do that. He meant for us to hurry up. The other companion said, he said, don't pray Asr except there and that's what we're going to do. So they differed. Those who said, we're just going to go with what he said. We're not going to try to figure out what he meant. Is what he said. We're not sure what he actually meant. Because maybe you're right, maybe you're not. And we're just going to stick with what he said. So we're going ahead. The other said, okay, fine. We're going to pray. So they prayed. They joined up. The place was sieged. Prophet Sallam, after the battle, then the companions came to the Prophet Sallam, talked to him about what happened. And of course, he prayed on the way. Right? So he didn't say anything to either group saying this one's right that one's wrong why because what he said could have been understood in both ways he accepted the idea of trying to understand the intent and applying the law based on your understanding as well as those who apply it based on the literal statement he accepted both but his own practice demonstrated that the intent was what he, of praying on the way, was really what was his intention. That was his intention, in practice, but not in statement. He didn't say, either of you were wrong. So it means then, this is showing us, this is the time of the Sahaba, where they could differ in understanding. Yet both of them are following the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so when we say, as I said, we need to get back to the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it doesn't mean we are going to go back to something where there are no differences. Meaning we'll find something which everybody's agreed on every single point. No. This is not the nature of how Allah has created us. We have been created with different understandings. And He has left in the Quran and in the Sunnah, things which could be interpreted in more than one way. And as long as people take a legitimate path in understanding that way, then it is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who is correct gets two rewards, and the one who is incorrect gets one. Because they took the correct way in trying to understand trying to apply the law to the best of their understanding, then Allah rewards them for that effort. Now there's a difference between that kind of difference 
And another kind of difference which happened, for example, Ibn Abbas, after the time of Rasulullah he's teaching tabi'een, the next generation, students. He's teaching them uh, about hajj, umrah, and so on and so on. And he's teaching them that umrah can be done in the months of hajj. Whilst he's teaching, one of the tabi'een, Urwa, the son of Asma bint Abi Bakr, sister of Aisha, he said, how can you be telling people to make Umrah in the months of Hajj when Abu Bakr and Umar said you can't? Not allowed. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, go ask your mother. Go ask your mother, you'll get clarity there. How can you raise a question? I am telling you what Rasulullah said, and you are telling me what Omar and Abu Bakr said. He was very upset. Your destruction is near. Once people reach that state where they give more precedence to the opinions of other human beings, when a clear statement of Rasulullah is brought, that is destruction. And that's one of the things, for example, that all of the Imams were agreed upon. That if an authentic hadith from Rasulullah comes to a person, for him to leave that for the opinion of any of them, they said, that this is not permissible. That is a path to destruction. So from that generation we can see differences, certain types of differences. Some differences which had to do with giving precedence of opinions over authentic sunnah and differences which arose from different interpretation of authentic sunnah. One is tolerated, is accepted, and the other one was rejected. The other one was rejected. So now, if we asked the tabi'een, the students of the Sahaba, what was your madhab? Qatada, we ask him, for example. What was your madhab? What is he going to say? He said, I follow the Abbasi madhab because I used to study under Ibn Abbas all the time. Or I follow the Al-Asi madhab because I used to study under Amr ibn al-As, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. Or I follow the different uh, leading scholars amongst the Sahaba. None of them use these attributions. They didn't do that. They would all say, we're following the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As it was conveyed to us by the Sahaba. As it was conveyed to us by the Sahaba. As it was understood by the Sahaba. Not just the conveyance, but also the understanding. Because we might accept a text as being authentic because it is authentically narrated. But the interpretation and understanding of that text, what does that depend on? It depends on the understanding of the Sahaba. Their understanding has to take precedence. We look back at the companions radiallahu anhum and how they understood these verses, these hadiths, it is not in the way that you have understood it. So now, if we ask the tabi'een, the students of the Sahaba, what was your madhab? Qatada, we ask him, for example. What was your madhab? What is he going to say? He said, I follow the Abbasi madhab because I used to study under Ibn Abbas all the time. Or I follow the Al-Asi madhab because I used to study under Amr ibn Al-As, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As. Or I follow the different uh, leading scholars amongst the Sahaba. None of them use these attributions. They didn't do that. They would all say, we're following the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As it was conveyed to us by the Sahaba, as it was conveyed to us 
by the Sahaba as it was understood by the Sahaba. Not just the conveyance, but also the understanding. Because we might accept a text as being authentic because it is authentically narrated. But the interpretation and understanding of that text, what does that depend on? It depends on the understanding of the Sahaba. Their understanding has to take precedence. We look back at the companions, how they understood these verses, these hadith, it is not in the way that you have understood it. That's why we need to go back to the way, the understanding of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad And the Prophet as we said before when he said about the way, the one way that is going to paradise, he said, مَا أَنَا عَلَيْهِ وَأَصْحَابِي That which I am on and my companions. So he added the companions as being a part of that way. And he also said, خَيْرُ nasi qarni." The best of people are my generation. So he stressed this, the importance of the companions. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an said, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاعَدْ مَصِيرًا That whoever contradicts and opposes the messenger after guidance has been made clear to him and he takes a path other than that of the believers we will leave him to himself and put him in hell a terrible end now it was sufficient for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say whoever contradicts the messenger we will leave him and put him in hell that's enough but he added and took a path other than the way of the believers and all of the scholars of tafsir plus are unanimous that when that verse was revealed the believers referred to the sahaba those who take a path other than the path of the sahaba they will be left to themselves and put in hell they'll go astray so the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu was conveyed by the sahaba to the tabi'in among them some scholars consider Abu Hanifa to be from among them that he didn't actually narrate from any of the sahaba but that he did see uh, the difference of opinion relative to whether he was or he wasn't. Anyway, we had then Abu Hanifa, leading scholar from the generation after, really among the Tabi Tabi'in. We ask him, Ya Abu Hanifa, O oh Abu Hanifa, what is your madhab? What is he going to say? The Hanafi madhab? No. He used to tell his companions, his students, don't write down what I tell you of my opinions. They said, why not? Because today I may hold an opinion, tomorrow I hold another opinion. And the day after I hold another opinion, and the day after that I have another opinion. So don't write them down. Just take from where I took it. Take it from where I took it. وَإِذَا صَحَ الْحَدِيثَ فَهُوَ مَذْهَبِي And if you find the hadith which is authentic, then that is really my madhab. So what is Abu Hanifa saying here? He's saying his madhab is the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the madhab of the Sahih Hadith. The Sahih Hadith is what conveys to us the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right. So this is what he would have said. Similarly, Imam Malik. Anybody asking him, he is not going to say, "I follow the Maliki madhab." He had no intention of making a madhab. He just taught. What? The sunnah. He taught the sunnah. Now, if we look at Imam Shafi'i, Imam Shafi'i is a classical example 
of the way of the companions, the tabi'in, tabi'u tabi'in. In that, the companions were on different grades. Some of them were with the Prophet ﷺ from the early days. Some of them accepted Islam just prior to the conquest of Mecca. Some of them after the conquest of Mecca. So they came into Islam at different stages. Some had more knowledge of the deen than others. So those who had less knowledge, they would study under those who had more. Those who were younger studied under those who were older. Sometimes the younger ones had more and people who were older studied under them. So they studied and were free to study under whoever was available. They would never say, I am only going to study under Abdullah ibn Umar, for example. Tabi'in, same thing. They would not stick to one companion and only study under him. No, they studied under him and they would go and study under other companions of the Prophet Wasallam Freely, nobody had a problem, nobody complained, nobody raised any issues, you know, that you're fatwa shopping. You know, this is the common point that comes up later on, right, in our times, you know, this fatwa shopping, right? Where you go to this madhab, you go here, you go there, you ask this one, you ask that one. And so the companions of the Prophet Wasallam they went, they asked. They asked his companion, they asked that one, they asked the other one. The tabi'in, they did the same thing. Tabi'u tabi'in did the same thing. And then Imam Shafi, student of Imam Malik for 20 years that we mentioned, didn't begin teaching until after Imam Malik died. Teaching in Yemen. He's accused of Shiite leanings, taken as a prisoner to Baghdad. He has to defend his position. He argued he was not leaning towards Shiism at all. He's released. There in Baghdad, he studied under Muhammad al-Shaybani, student of Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa is already dead. So he studied under his students. He gained knowledge there. Now when he was in Yemen teaching, he was teaching based on the knowledge he had accumulated from Imam Malik. After studying under the students of Abu Hanifa, he changed a number of his opinions and he wrote a book called Al-Hujjah. His book called Al-Hujjah. And there he outlined his positions, his new positions, where he changed from positions of Imam Malik, etc. Then he went to Egypt in order to study under Imam al Layth, but Imam al Layth had died already. So he studied under Imam al Layth's students. After studying under Imam al Layth's students, he changed a bunch of his opinions again. He wrote a new book called Al Um. This was the classic Al Um in which he changed those opinions. He stayed in Egypt and he became the Imam of that area. Now, he changed his opinion. He changed his position. Because some people have a problem. You know, they said, okay, I hear this, for example, in Dubai where I am. People come, they say, okay, we're studying here in Dubai, we're listening under the scholars here in Dubai and they tell us one thing. When we go back to India, the scholars there tell us something else. And then when we come back again, those other scholars tell us something else. I, you know, isn't it better just to take one and just say, that's it, I'm just going to hang on to that one, just so I'm not going here back and forth and here and there? Isn't it better? This is the argument. It sounds logical, you know, so you have some stability in your opinions and you know how you can function. But the reality is, did Imam Shafi have just one opinion and stick with that one opinion? No. And isn't he better than we are? Wasn't he more knowledgeable? Right? Because the idea most people have is a scholar, he has his opinion, he never changes his opinion. People might change their opinion, but not the scholar. Right? This is a common. The idea that a scholar says one opinion, then somebody happens to bring some argument to him, he has to change his opinion and say, oh man, this is not a real scholar here. He changed his opinion. You know, but it's well known. Imam Malik, for example, used to teach that when you make wudu, washing your feet, you don't stick your fingers between your toes. And he was teaching that. One class, one of his students said, Imam Malik, I heard a narration from Rasulullah through the chain, mentioning the whole chain, of course, that the Prophet used to put his fingers between his toes when he was 
washing his feet. Imam Malik, next class, corrected himself and taught it. No problem. No problem. Nobody said, oh, Imam Malik, oh, oh changed his opinion, doesn't really know everything now, you know. This is no. They accepted that. And if we can accept Imam Shafi changing these, this is real scholarship. That nobody knows everything. You know, as when Imam Malik was asked, if we follow, if a person follows a Sahabi in everything that he does, will he be on the correct path? Right? And remember, there's a hadith that people commonly quote, Ashabi ken nujum. My companions are like stars. If any one of them you follow, you'll be rightly guided. It's a commonly quoted uh, hadith in support of sticking to one person, one group, one madhab, whatever, and just... However, it turns out it's fabricated. And Imam Malik says to the man who asked him that, No! You will not be on the right path unless that Sahabi was on the right path. Because the only one who is free from error is the one in that grave. He pointed to the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That is the reality. So everyone is capable of error. And the defining principle is the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 